and welcome. I'm Marco Tassoni. I'm director of the Geneva Academy, and you are very welcome to this IHL talk on uh, foreign fighters and their families. Um, I see a lot of well-known faces. Nevertheless, um, perhaps also one or two new ones. I will be very short about the Geneva Academy, which is a joint center of uh, the, the law faculty of the University of Geneva and the Gravel Institute of International and Development Studies. And we have uh, three masters, out of which one is an executive master for professionals who cannot dedicate their uh, whole time to studying. Uh, we engage in research projects. Welcome. Uh, among them also Dr. Krayerman, uh, before when she worked for the Geneva Academy, uh, wrote a very important uh, research paper precisely on foreign fighters. So it is on humanitarian law, human rights, sometimes international criminal law. And we are, because we benefit from this uh, Villa Boignier, perhaps also because of that, a platform where people meet uh, more informally um, to discuss current challenges in uh, humanitarian law and human rights in Geneva. Um, diplomats, uh, <coughs> representatives of uh, civil society, civil servants and academics, and one of the uh, uh, forms in which we are such a platform is, are these IHL talks. Their aim is to give an opportunity seven or eight times a year to speak about the contemporary IHL issue in a broader context and to discuss, um, you know, to allow um, academics, civil servants, uh, diplomats uh, who perhaps do not necessarily always see the legal implications and framework of such issues to become more familiar with that. Uh, well, we are uh, speaking today about foreign fighters. Obviously, I will not speak about the substance. Uh, it is a serious humanitarian problem. There are some 2,000 detained in northern Syria. And I will come back to that. We should not forget that there are also 3,000 Syrian fighters uh, allegedly uh, having joined ISIS who are detained, and uh, some 11,000 of their uh, family members. But, and this is perhaps even more important for the Academy, because unfortunately such numbers of people affected by armed conflict are not rare in the world, it is also a symbol for what I would think are three phenomena. The first one is unfortunately not new, but it is a good symbol for that <laughs> phenomenon, that in armed conflicts, some people are seen as so bad that they do no longer benefit from the guarantees and the protection and the respect uh, uh, foreseen by the law because more or less everyone in the world recognizes humanitarian law but um, there is a great tendency and this is not a new tendency to exclude some people from humanitarian law or from human rights and in this case it's not uh, people who were sentenced for crimes but who are simply suspect and their spouses and their children. Second and more legally um, it's a symbol for the uh, challenge which is not only for humanitarian law but specific, uh, also important in humanitarian law, that international law, despite all modern theories, is still very much state-oriented. And at least from a legal point of view, if these foreign fighters were not detained by a non-state actor in northern Syria, but by a state, 
the solutions, be it an international tribunal or domestic prosecution, would be much easier and we could not really have a purely legal IHL talk about it, then it would be mainly a question, a humanitarian question and a question of implementation. And this is indeed one of the great challenges. I always compare states with, now she is no longer there, but my granddaughter two uh, years ago when she was four, she thought that if she covers her eyes, I don't see her. And this is exactly how states unfortunately function, that they think if we ignore uh, non-state actors, uh, non-state actors will disappear. And this is, we will hear, one of the big challenges to find a solution that states, even those states which have absolutely no sympathy for the Syrian regime, uh, will be quite reluctant to recognize that non-state actors can try people. Uh, and a third point which is particularly dear to my heart in this whole discussion, I have the impression that the focus is always on the foreign fighters, but from the point of view of humanitarian law and human rights, I don't see any difference between Syrian, Iraqi or foreign fighters. The only point where there could be a de legitimate difference is that obviously foreign fighters have a home country and the home country, if the home country chooses <coughs> to let them come back and to try them, the home country has jurisdiction over them even for crimes which are not international crimes. But this is precisely what at least the European home countries do not want. And therefore, all other solutions we discuss must, in my view, cover both the foreign fighters and the local fighters. I don't see why foreign fighters should have a, a better trial, a fairer trial, than uh, domestic uh, fighters uh, suspected uh, to have belonged uh, to the so-called Islamic State. But that was already too long. And I pass the floor to Emily Max, who is our researcher on this issue and the great guiding spirit for the IHL talks and who will uh, moderate this discussion. And I thank uh, the panelists who will be introduced by Emily Max to have joined us in the middle, and you obviously, uh, to have joined us in the midst of the summer for such a are such a sad discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stephanie. Thank you, everybody, for coming in the middle of summer and also on a Friday. Um, at lunchtime. At, at lunchtime, <laughs> when we're not offering any kind of food. Um, so we're joined today with three distinguished uh, panelists whom I thank for coming and uh, taking the time to have this discussion with us. Um, introducing them in alphabetical order, first we have Nadim Huri, who is now the executive director of a think tank called the Arab Reform Initiative, and who was until very recently the director of the Terrorism and Counterterrorism Program with Human Rights Watch. He has traveled many times, as he was just telling us, to northern <coughs> Syria, where he has uh, visited and interviewed foreign fighters. Uh, we then have Salha Krianman, Dr. Krianman, who is a legal advisor with an NGO called Geneva Call, here in Geneva, and she was previously um, here with the Academy, where she most notably authored a brief on foreign fighters under international law. And last but not least, we have Wanda Toza, who is a child protection advisor with the International Committee of the Red Cross, and who has also been uh, to the camps in northeast Syria, and who has um, witnessed the conditions there. So the way we will proceed is we'll have, you know, um, questions um, to be answered from each of the panelists, and then um, hopefully about 50 minutes um, for questions from the floor. Um, so without further ado, uh, Wanda, if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about what you've been seeing in Al Hall in terms of you know facts, figures, and their humanitarian consequences. Yes. <coughs> Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, so um, yes, as. Uh, um, uh, and we said I traveled to um, uh, Anhol camp uh, last uh, April and uh, I would like to talk uh, to you a little bit of what uh, we have uh, seen and what uh, 
uh, the ICRC is uh, doing uh, in, uh, in the camps and in northeast Syria. The, the humanitarian situation as it was uh, presented, uh, it still and remains uh, dire. Uh, the influx of uh, people uh, that uh, were formerly uh, associated to Islamic State, um, formerly living in, in uh, controlled areas of the Islamic State, uh, started a couple of years ago and uh, it really increased parallel to the hostilities uh, around uh, December 2018 into March 2019 and as a result uh, now they are uh, hosted in three main camps, one being Al Hol, Roj and Ain Isa. Um, Al Hol being the largest, it's uh, estimated that there's approximately 74,000 people <coughs> there. Uh, which is a uh, medium to almost large uh, uh, city uh, uh, these days. Um, approximately 34,000 are um, Syrian, 30,000 are Iraqi, and 11,000 uh, people in Al Hol are um, foreigners, or well, Iraqi are also foreigners, but third uh, um, country nationals. Um, the other two camps estimates of their size are a little bit more unclear, but we can think that there would be possibly around 14,000 people in Ain Hissa and 2,000 in Broch, although the breakdown of the Syrian Iraqis and third country nations is a little bit more uh, unclear. However, the population that we're talking about is a very large population. Um, I only had a chance to visit uh, Al Hol. Um, uh, Nadim uh, just mentioned that he had seen uh, uh, all three of them, um, and um, and basically the population of these camps is mainly constituted by women, girls, and uh, young children. Uh, it's estimated that. It's up to 90% the percentage of women and children in the camps and 66% approximately it's children, um, young children. So this population is also thought to be possibly increasing in the coming months because many of the women are pregnant and so children are coming to birth uh, on a daily basis in the camps. Most of these women are widows or they have been separated from their husbands who are uh, missing. Um, and uh, a great percentage of, uh, of them is also taking care of children with whom they might not necessarily have a family tie. A lot of these children are unaccompanied or separated and so they're taken care by women that are not members of their family, which of course represents an element of, uh, of worry to um, a certain extent. Um, many of these children were born in Syria um, and they might not have documents that uh, provide them with a clear identity. Um, this of course uh, limits their access to basic uh, rights, uh, basic services. Uh, and uh, to and there's a, a very serious risk of statelessness that these children uh, run without having uh, documents uh, with them. Documents might have gone lost in the conflict. They might have been confiscated at different steps of uh, uh, of uh, the conflict, uh, or maybe they were documents that were issued by the Islamic State and then they are not recognized by other entities. So um, this creates a vacuum for, for these children um, and uh, big work needs to be done to provide them with an identity and a nationality. Um, personally, I have to admit, despite many years of humanitarian work in different contexts, I had never seen before uh, so many children, and I will say it in a bit of a rough way, but I had never seen so many children with missing body parts. Uh, this population had uh, uh, fled the conflict uh, very, uh, very uh, um, hostile uh, 
um, conflict and uh, they arrived to the camps strained and seriously wounded. So um, with the um, uh, Norwegian Red Cross uh, and with the SARC, that is the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, ICC has set up a camp hospital in Alho uh, between May and, uh, and uh, June. We could, uh, we could open activities. Uh, we have now also um, a primary health care clinic and mobile units in the camp. Uh, however, this is only scratching the, the important needs that this very large uh, population. Uh, there is no education provided in the camps, no recreational activities, uh, which um, makes uh, that these children roam in the camp, in the best case scenario, doing petty duties and uh, distributing water or food uh, uh, and uh, rather aimlessly and purposelessly uh, roam in the camp without toys nor activities nor a purpose to their life. And this is particularly worrisome when we think that it's children for whom every month and every, and unfortunately for many of them years, uh, are wasted uh, for their development. Uh, and also considering the, the traumas that they may have lived, their reinsertion into society needs to be started as soon as possible because every week and month lost is, a, is an important uh, baggage that these children will have to carry with them later on. Um, together with the hospital that I mentioned earlier, ICRC is also providing Hands, water, um, and uh, and um, an important work of uh, restoring family links. This is a very classical activity of uh, the committee. Um, we we look for people not only within Syria, because uh, many of the families have been separated within Syria, within the camps. But also, of course, uh, there are families back home, the countries of origin, that ask us to find their dear ones. And uh, so this is a, a big part with uh, very many challenges uh, of, uh, of, um, of our work. Um, we do that uh, through, mainly through, I don't know if everybody is familiar with the concept of Red Cross messages. It's messages that are distributed, it's open messages uh, that are only to to bring family news that are distributed uh, within the country, some countries from ICRC teams or within the network of the Red Crescent and uh, across uh, movement across, across the world. When it comes to foreigners specifically, we do, uh, when the, the people are willing, we do register them and notify them to their consular authorities so that states are aware of the presence of their citizens in the camps. Uh, that is not uh, always the case. If the person doesn't wish to be notified to their authorities, of course we don't, we don't uh, do that. But upon request, uh, this is one of the services that we, that we provide. And we have uh, seen more than 70 nationalities. So um, it's true that we might uh, often have from here uh, a European perspective, but actually uh, there are more than 70 nationalities uh, uh, represented in the camps and they're coming from everywhere, Middle East, Northern Africa, uh, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, Americas. It's, it's really wide, uh, wide, uh, widespread and uh, it's a global um, phenomenon. And, um, uh, and countries of origin have different attitudes, uh, different countries have very different attitudes towards this population. We have seen uh, uh, countries being more uh, conservative and restrictive when it comes to repatriation of their citizens and they might set up uh, different uh, criteria, only the children, only the children up to a certain age, uh, only children, maybe their mothers, or other countries are much more open to uh, repatriating their whole population, even including uh, men. Of course, these different attitudes 
uh, bring uh, with them different kind of concerns. Uh, for example, uh, when um, uh, when states are open to repatriate only children, then the question of family unity and family separation comes up. Uh, because, of course, that is um, a big concern when it comes to, to children in particular, separating them from their parents or from older siblings. Or uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there might be, uh, in certain situations, concerns of non refoulement. Uh, so, uh, if the person expresses uh, a preoccupation for their protection once repatriated to the country of, uh, of origin, uh, that also is something that needs to be taken, uh, taken into account. Um, in particular, in, um, in Syria there is at the moment a lack of uh, a process and a structure for determining the best interests of the child, which is the basis for, upon which uh, uh, family separation could happen uh, uh, after thorough uh, evaluation or in general uh, any decision taken uh, on children's uh, future needs to be based on uh, their best interests and at the moment it's impossible to determine it um, in, uh, in northern eastern uh, Syria. So, of course, this brings a lot of question when it comes to taking action on these children and up until now it's been uh, based on uh, uh, assumption that repatriation is better than the dear conditions of, uh, of, uh, of the camps. Um, but, of course, when this choice leads to a conflict of rights of the children, then a better informed decision needs, of course, to be, to be taken. Uh, when it comes to our work and to our considerations on the country of uh, origin, uh, when uh, repatriations have, uh, have occurred, we are also, of course also active in, uh, in, uh, in countries of destination, countries of origin, uh, mainly uh, offering support for the smooth reintegration of these children into, into society, uh, taking into account uh, um, uh, the, the, the traumas and the events that they might have uh, been going through. Um, we believe that taking charge of their mental health and psychosocial well-being is key and to reinsert them into society together with social uh, support to the families uh, and uh, to the education system. Um, we have also seen very different attitudes. We have seen some states reunifying children with uh, their families uh, upon returning, very uh, rapidly upon return, and other states having a more conservative uh, attitude justified with security considerations and then keeping these children on foster, uh, foster care for a longer period. Um, uh, so um, this is this varies also from from country to country a lot. Uh, the key that we have noticed is also the public discourse, the media uh, role in uh, in uh, displaying uh, uh, this uh, this population. And um, it's it's true that as uh, um, as more negative the vision of this population is, more. Uh, states are reluctant to take uh, um, decisions that are uh, open to, to a reintegration. Uh, I would just like to finish on one uh, note that I'm uh, glad Professor Sassoli already mentioned uh, earlier and it's a very um, dear point uh, to us. Um, it's true that the foreigner uh, population is getting a lot of uh, attention because uh, uh, probably it's a trickier situation to, to deal with. But the, the same uh, needs that I have been uh, mentioning up to now, lack of documentation, stigmatization, psychological trauma, family separation, access to healthcare, options for return, um, and uh, reintegration into societies are concerns that touch upon the overall population of people um, perceived associated to the Islamic State. So this is a much larger um, concern that touches not only the Syrians, but also the Iraqis, so 
also not only northern East Syria but Iraq itself. So it's uh, it's something that uh, um, we would like to to. I, I know it's not the topic of the day today, but we would like to flag because we should not forget that part of the population. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a great setting of the stage, and as you said, it's very important to remind yourself that. Um, much of the discourse from the media and also from the political side is very focused on the foreigners, but you know it's a more broad issue. And as you know, a lot of the discourse and the attention is also, also focused on the children because they make up for the bulk of the population of, of the camps, and also because in terms of humanity, it's easier to feel you know towards them. But um, it would be interesting to hear from Sandra if there are um, legal reasons or if the relevant legal frameworks allow for actually distinguishing between the children and their relatives or, or not, uh, actually. Well, I think if, um, uh, one point I always like to make, because you often speak about phone fighters and then you have the children and their wives. Um, I think in IHL, you know, the distinctions are based on whether you are a combatant or a fighter or whether you are a civilian. That's the opposite of fighter is not woman and child. Um, so I think we need to be wary also of having like implicit gendered ways of how we approach these populations. And we have the problem of the women and children in camp, but then we also have the men. And we also have men being the detained and men being tried. So I think it's important that, that we remember that. All these populations, when they are detained, they are all the four bars. So they're all entitled to protection. Maybe like easy to focus on women and children, but we also have the men. And when we speak about foreign fighters, but I think it more generally encroaches up on how we look at people who were associated with ISIS, is the way foreign fighter is used in this course is it covers much broader forms of association with an armed group than we would consider a fighter under IHL. So it's not limited to people who have actually directly participated in hostilities with ISIL or who have um, exercised a continuous combat function. It also makes that there is this blurring of the line. Um, and on the one hand, they like to separate them, but on the other hand, everybody is included. Um, so having said that, I mean, we speak about populations that are detained in the context of an armed conflict. So they are interned and they have not been um, tried and convicted. So of course, if you look at IHL, if everybody is protected um, uh, when they are detained, but you do have special rules for women and children. Um, and I think in particular for children is um, what you've just mentioned, you know, that we need to pay particular attention to their special needs and vulnerabilities, including taking into account their age. So it's not that this is something that um, we just made up, but it's also a recognition of um, the particular vulnerability that children have in various forms in an armed conflict. Something else you also have in IHL is, of course, you know, normally child recruitment is prohibited. So all these children who were um, recruited in by just following their parents um, or being born with ISIS, I mean, they're also victims of a crime. And here we'll come back to um, what both one and Professor Sassoli mentioned, is that we see this tendency that some people are so bad, they're not being protected neither by IHL nor human rights law. And we see that even being applied to children. Um, we could easily frame the question of children associated with ISIS, including when they leave ISIS, as a child soldier demobilization problem. And then we could, would have a protective framework. The way we look at it framed now in, in public discourse and by states is from a terrorist perspective. These are children that pose a security risk and therefore we primarily address them from a security perspective, which is a very different way of approaching the issue than considering them child soldiers. And I think there we have seen a significant shift in the way how we look at not just the foreign children, but also the Syrian and Iraqi children, that we don't, we rarely see them being addressed as child soldiers. We see them as children who are a potential future threat and something needs to be done to eliminate that threat, rather than how can we make sure that these children can be reintegrated into societies. I think that's another um, aspect where it really goes very far because we see it um, applied to those who are the most vulnerable. 
Um, another framework, and then we would have the complicating factors of, you know, does he want groups and whether to what extent. Human rights law, of course, has a series of rules specifically on the protection of children, including the best interests of the child. And I agree with you, I don't think it's easy to apply the best interest of the child in these kind of contexts. Uh, one thing I want to flag is, and you also mentioned that, we quite often see um, when we speak about the family unit, it's quite often reduced to the link between the mother and the child. While the family unit is a much broader concept, it includes the link to the father, if the father is still alive, and it also includes the link to siblings. And we have seen that some states will only take back children up to a certain age, in particular if they're boys. So that would be another way how the family unit can also be reached, that you um, take away children from their siblings, and that's part of the relationship that is protected. In human rights laws, we would normally define a child up to 18. So that's the, like the scope of application for protection of children in the context of the foreign fighter children, but I think more broadly also the Iraqi and Syrian children, we have seen states using a variety of different age thresholds based on um, their assessment of how dangerous children become when they become more older, and that has zero basis in law. And I also think that's something we need to be mindful that we do not undermine the child protection regime by accepting these age thresholds that do not really have a legal basis. So that's like the protective framework where yes, I think there is a tendency to exclude them from that. Because what it is replaced with the bad guys, they are being replaced with the counter-terrorism framework. And I think there is where you have something specific for foreign fighters, and a lot of the states of origin approach it primarily from that perspective. As you know, the Security Council has adopted two resolutions on foreign fighters. It had one in 2014, 2178, which did not talk at all about the women and the children. And our briefing didn't talk about it at all, neither. It wasn't something that was very much um, on the radar of people, even though it already happened. Um, what that resolution basically does, um, and it provides for a general comprehensive framework how states should prevent the movement of what they call foreign terrorist fighters. So there you can also see the association between terrorism and something that is taking place in an armed conflict. So the resolution asks states to uh, make sure that it is a prosecutable offence to travel abroad with the intention of becoming involved in acts of terrorism, which is a very broad um, offence that quite often already existed in various variations in national law, either under material support or very broad visions of preparatory acts. But it gives a clear mandate to all states to do that. And that presents a set of issues in and of itself. And then with the changes in Syria and Iraq, when ISIL started to lose ground and they started to fear that people may actually come back, the Security Council adopted a new resolution in December 2017, um, which focuses specifically on returnees. And there we can see for the first time they also mention either accompanying family members, they mention um, spouses and children, um, so there is a recognition that you have the foreign fighters and then you have what is adjacent to them, their families. Um, I think what is important in that resolution is that there is a recognition that states should distinguish between those who have been involved in crimes and those who have not. I think that's a very positive step. They also recognize that, um, what Wanda also mentioned, you know, that many of the women and children may also have been victims, actually, in these armed conflicts. Um, so from a recognition perspective, I thought this was quite interesting and good. In terms of practical consequences, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, because the terrorist offences or the foreign fighter related offences that we see in national law are so broad in scope that they're going to cover um, a woman who travels with her husband to Syria. That's going to be a terrorist offence. The same will be true for the child. I think it could make a difference for the children who were born in Syria and Iraq. 
but for those who traveled voluntarily, I don't see how this actually makes a difference. So to some extent, I also thought it was a bit of playing lip service to um, a humanitarian concern that existed, but it's not clear how this is actually going to play out in, in practice. But at least I think it gives us something to work with uh, when you, you speak to states. You may have noticed now that um, first I spoke about preventing travel, including by the use of criminal law measures, which one can discuss whether that's appropriate or not, and then about returnees. So the focus of these resolutions is very much also on states of origins, um, what they have to do um, in respect of what is their own population who traveled abroad. Thank you. And to, you know, to complement, the focus is on state of origin having criminalized certain behaviors, mm -hmm. but do states of origin have actually their own obligation towards people who have traveled to either Syria or Iraq? I mean, states of origin, they took a host of measures trying to prevent people mm -hmm. from leaving. I think the criminal law ones are other is one of them. You have a series of it's in many administrative measures um, like passport confiscation and so on. Um, if you want to understand the approach taken by states of origins and if you contrast it to states of destination, mm -hmm. I think the whole foreign fight, the, <coughs> the regime of foreign fight, it's very much the two competing policy aims. Now you have states of origins who are afraid that people who travel abroad become associated with designated terrorist groups, they're going to come back home being trained in explosive weapons, having experience um, in combat, that they're going to come back home and undertake terrorist attacks or set up new cells. And there is some, uh, there are some studies on the likelihood of that happening. But so from that perspective, is of course, you may not want people to leave, but once they have left, you don't want them back. Mm -hmm. From a state of destination perspective, and also from a humanitarian perspective, we know from some studies that foreign fighters always have a negative impact in armed conflicts. They tend to um, bring with them a certain radicalization of ideology and tactics, and they tend to contribute to the splintering of armed groups into different factions, and they tend to be a spoiler when it comes to peace talks. So it's bad for the armed conflict if you have foreigners. And from that perspective, you obviously, you primarily want them to not go. But those are two different aims, preventing return and preventing from going. And I think the, the camp situation we now see, you can really see the clash there. You know, they're always there, and states are very reluctant to take them back. And a lot of European states, they will also say, you know, we do not have the capacity to deal with them. We don't have enough people, which I find like a troubling argument because it's not as if the uh, authorities in the camps have the capacity to deal with them. But it's something you hear very common that we do not have the capacity to deal with hundreds of potential terrorists. So let's just leave them abroad. Um, when now we think about the um, obligation states have, um, and I think the question of, um, at least you know, that they are in, in detention camps that are run by what is a non-state actors, because what we would normally look at is how it's diplomatic protection as well. And of course, as every student of international law knows, diplomatic protection is a discretionary right of the state, but it's also a state-to-state -state right. But in the context of Guantanamo Bay, we arrived at least at a recognition that states should at least consider exercising diplomatic protection, so that the people would have a legitimate expectations that a state at least considers it. How that can work out if the detaining authority is not a state, that is not clear at all. Um, and many states would simply not refuse to actually implement that. I think something else that we have seen is um, one way states try to prevent people from coming back is by removing citizenship. We have seen that many more states have added deprivation of citizenship as part of their counterterrorism arsenal. Um, 
with the foreign fight phenomenon, we have seen the largest wave of new counter-terrorism laws and measures since 9-11. And I think one of the distinctive features is really this resort into deprivation of citizenship. And that is, of course, then also a way to abdicate any <coughs> kind of responsibility. I think it can create additional problems um, of what Wanda just mentioned. Generally, there is a problem of establishing lineage for the children. If one of the parents has also been deprived of their citizenship, what does this mean for the children? If they still have citizenship, they could go back, but then what about the parents? Um, I think that would be a complicating factor when we speak about repatriation. Um, and of course, international law has a lot of things to say about the mm -hmm. privation of citizenship. You know, we would normally say you should not be um, rendered stateless. But what we have also seen is that sometimes states think that somebody has a second nationality or may be entitled to one, um, and they may render the person inadvertently stateless. Um, and if people are deprived of the nationality while they are abroad, it also means that um, they have no remedies, um, even less if they're detained in a camp. But I think more generally, we need to remember that depriving somebody of their citizenship is a measure that produces permanent effects. It's not something that is reversible. That person loses any kinds of rights in relation to their state of origin. So I think it's a, the most severe kind of administrative measure you can take um, against these people. Um, the last point I think we should make in relation to state's obligations. What is interesting about the Security Council resolutions, as I said before, you know, and I'm, I'm very critical of the Security Council resolutions generally, but they are very much also based on a cooperative approach, where they say precisely this is a global problem, states of origin, states of transit, and states of destination, they need to cooperate. I think one can make a pretty good argument that blanket refusals to repatriate people or taking active measures to prevent people from coming back probably undermines that cooperative spirit. Because you're no longer cooperating with the states in there, you just basically say, this is your problem now, this is no longer our problem. And importantly, in that resolution, I mean, it has a very carceral and penal approach speaking about prosecutions, but it also recognizes rehabilitation and reintegration and specifically asks states to think about rehabilitation and reintegration measures and policies for returnees. So I think that's also something one can try to use when speaking to states of origins, that this is not just something that the humanitarian sector invented, that's actually something they themselves put in a Security Council resolution. Thank you, Sandra. I think what's, what's at least I find very interesting is that it's a phenomenon that states have given a lot of thought and action at its outset. So from the perspective of, you know, people going and now we're at a time where it's being very difficult to actually come up with a cooperative or a common approach to what do we do with these people now and do we repatriate them? And I think that's why I'd like to hear Nadim on, you know, has there been some kind of coherent approach from states and how difficult it is, given that we're talking about over 70 nationalities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be actually a bit blunt uh, this morning, because uh, yes, I think it's easy sometimes when we're sitting here in Geneva, beautiful view, talk about international law, we forget really a bit what's at stake. I think what we're seeing in northeast Syria is a Guantanamo on the Euphrates. We have to call it as it is. It's a Guantanamo that is not the responsibility of the Kurds or of the Syria Democratic Forces, but mostly of the Western countries. Okay. Who is responsible? Who is funding the prisons where all these men are being held in Northeast Syria? Is it Syrian taxpayers? Is it the money of the Syria Democratic Forces? No. It's coalition and US money. Who decides who gets to enter these prisons to visit or not? The first level is the Kurds or the Syria Democratic Forces. But who is behind this decision? It is the Western countries. Who decides whether you are allowed to go see a French family today in one of the camps? 
It's not the local camp authority. They are just implementing what the French government is telling them. Do you want an example? 10 days ago, there were French grandparents who went to see their grandkids in one of the camps. They were a group of three families, three different European nationalities. Okay? The Kurdish authorities had assured them that they're going to get access. They got the papers. They got to the camp. Two of the families went in. The French family was not allowed in. Okay. A bunch of calls were made. No one would give a reason. But we know the reason. The French don't want anyone. The French government does not want anyone, including grandparents, to be able to visit their nationals. Now, legally speaking, we're saying, yeah, it's a non-state actor holding these groups. But we, to use an analogy from corporate law, we have to pierce the veil. Okay? This was not, you know, Raqqa was not retaken, Deir ez was not retaken by this non-state actor working alone. It was one of the biggest coalitions since World War II that actually retook these areas. When countries say, well, we don't have consular uh, representation in this country, and I bump into French special forces, British special forces, American special forces, we have a problem. When the French say, well, we have to wait for the ICRC to send us a list of our nationals, and then it gets leaked that they have a detailed list with every single name of every single child, of every single adult that is, that is being held. When I go see the most senior security official of the Kurds and they show me that all their interrogation are being shared with all Western intelligence agencies, we have a problem. Who is responsible? I think this is the key issue. We, ha we cannot have this discussion as sort of they are being held by this non-state actor that is not cooperating or that sort of exists on the margins of the law. This is a non-state group that since day one, since two years ago, when the first families were being held, was begging, begging countries to come and take their nationals. Okay. I think this is really what is at stake today. And we are hiding in a way, and frankly, Europe is having its Guantanamo moment, but they are hiding and blaming it on the SDF so that they keep their hands clean. But frankly, I think it's a shameful moment. And when this episode ends up being written, I think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of blame uh, on European countries. And we can sort of deconstruct the international legal arguments one by one, if you want. But I, what I want to say, yes, it's a humanitarian crisis. I mean, what you didn't say, when I was there in February, for instance, children were dying every day in the camp. There were more than 70 children. Just to give you an example, this is the biggest coalition since the end of World War II. Okay? There were, at the moment, at the Hajin, at the last pocket, there were four drones that were filming every single moment of the battle. So everyone knew, or should have known, given that they had all these drones filming every single movement, and you know, this is sort of the biggest coalition since World War II, the number of families. They all made their way out. Okay? It was January, February, so it's dead of the winter, it's the desert, it gets very, very cold at night. These children had been in terrible conditions. I mean, they did not lose their limbs randomly. They lost their limbs for two reasons, either coalition bombing or SDF bombing, but most of it was coalition bombing, or two, basically, landmines left behind by ISIS. Okay. So let's, put, let's see who's responsible for these children. When these children and, and these families came out, uh, the coalition, again, one of the wealthiest coalitions, four drones, you know, all the, all the technology, did not think about having buses to transport these people to Al Hol camp, which is a nine hour drive away. Okay. So how did they transport them? Well, at the beginning, they left them for two, three days in the middle of the cold. The only humanitarians who were present at the time were these crazy free Burma rangers. I don't know if anyone has heard of them. You can Google them after this session. They're, this is one family that's like these crazy messianic stuff. It's one family. That was it. Okay. They were then transferred after two or three nights when actually some kids died in the cold on that spot. They were taken to the Al Amari camp where they, had, where they were screened. And again, this is where we see the high tech of the coalition. They screened the eye, uh, eyes and of all the adults. Okay. But no one thought about providing a doctor for the children. No one thought about providing you know, uh, nappies for the children. So actually, kids died being transported of what? Of dehydration of cold. I mean, this is, this is for me the real outrage, is that this is not some local fight by some non-state actor in an area that no one can reach. This is what's happening in an area that probably has the highest concentration of drones, satellite imagery, high-tech equipment as we speak. And then you go to Western countries and they say, but we don't have diplomatic representation for Syria. We can do nothing for them. At the same time that they have two diplomats, the French had two diplomats, it al-Holkan 
aside administering aid for other stuff. But they, when, when I actually got to the camp and I heard they were there, I rushed to find them. They ran away from me, literally ran away from me and jumped in their car because they didn't want to, you know, if I took a photo saying here, they're in the camp so they can obviously see the children. Okay. So I, I start with that. and I don't want to be dramatic, but the situation is dramatic. And we knew it was coming. Okay. And uh, some of us tried to warn, uh, warn of the situation two years ago when the numbers were small. I mean, the, the irony of the Resolution 2178, it was intended to deal with this situation. So actually, all these countries were told in 2014, change your criminal code so you can actually prosecute these people. So they all went and they adopted all these overbroad counterterrorism laws. And then they're like, actually, you know what? We'd rather they stay there. You know? We'll pay the Iraqis, we'll pay the SDF. That's what's happening. It's outsourcing uh, and it's horrendous. And, when I, and it's true that the, we can talk about the media responsibility, but you know the average age of these children? I mean, a lot of people, when you hear the public debates, you would imagine all these 14, 15 year old battle hardened, you know. Yeah. In my experience, I don't know if you would agree with me, 90 to 95% are under six years old. Most of them are under three years old. Okay. I mean, if one thing ISIS was very good about was its natality policy. Huh? It's one year, one child. It's actually quite scary. Huh? The, they are, the, there is a group, the, the teenagers, those who may have joined Ashbal al-Khilafa, the uh, cubs of the caliphate, they're a tiny minority. And they're being held in a different center called Al-Hori Center. Uh, but the overwhelming numbers are tiny, tiny children. Um, so I think I, I just wanted to sort of to, to, to say that. I think too, uh, it's sort of to go back to the issue of responsibility on the internment. Uh, so it's when when the Kurds say, uh, you know, the debate has been very much who's going to prosecute them. And I think that's a key question. But one of the other questions for what crime? Because when you go and you see the local authorities and you say, okay, show me your counterterrorism law. Okay. The counterterrorism law that's being applied in Northeast Syria would actually fit on this page. I don't know if any of you have read it. Okay. It's six articles, or seven, I can't remember now. 99% uh, of what women did would not be criminalized today under the laws that are being applied in Northeast Syria. You know, the, the Kurds did not, I mean, even if you put aside all the IHL, non-state actors can apply or cannot apply. If they're going to apply today, their current, that the one that they have applied, they would not apply because this is a law you know, kind of an old school type counterterrorism law. Uh, you get prosecuted if you put a bomb, if you killed someone, and so forth. They don't have all the bells and whistles if you happen to marry and move or, or so forth. Uh, uh, none of that exists. So when everyone says, well, let them be prosecuted, yeah, maybe we can have the discussion about those who actually committed violent crimes. But all the ones who are just, you know, association, I mean, they're not prosecuting these crimes. They're not interested. I mean, can you imagine if the uh, Kurds of Northeast Syria were to prosecute everyone who joined ISIS or somehow was affiliated with ISIS? I mean, people tend to forget ISIS controlled cities for three, four years. They had municipal workers. They paid salaries. So if you're going to take the list of everyone who got paid a salary by ISIS to say you were a member of ISIS, good luck. You know, this, this is the, the so, I, you know, I think this is the, the, the uh, so it is a human rights crisis. It's a legal crisis. Uh, and uh, it's also a crisis of values. Okay? Because by keeping this population in limbo, okay, men, women, and children, because I agree, there isn't, you know, uh, for me, the children, it's, it's very clear. I mean, the overwhelming majority of children are even under the age of criminal responsibility. They cannot be held responsible. Uh, you have the issue, okay, what do you do with them? And it goes back to your issue about, you know, the best interest of the child. But here as well, I have a bit of a, I mean, if we're going to have hearings that go on for two years to determine the best interest of the child, we have a bit of a problem. When we have jurisprudence in most countries that if a parent beats their child once, it's not in the best, best interest of the child to stay with the parent, okay? And then if you say, okay, well, my parents took me to live under ISIS, or my parents did that, I'm pretty sure what the best interest of the child is on a preemptive basis. You know, the determination can happen later. But the situation is so dramatic, I, I'm reluctant that we add layers of complexity. The complexity is there, but we need to find practical solutions so people are not dying from skin disease, from asthma. I have asthma. When I go to these camps and spend a few days, I'm coughing you know, by the end of day two. Why? Because around these camps, there are a lot of informal um, oil wells. 
okay, and they burn them. I mean, the air is, half the kids in these camps have pulmonary infections. Uh, you know, everyone, for years, we've had the Security Council, all these anti-ISIS coalition, you know, we have to do CVE, PVE. I, when I hear that today, I want to just shoot myself in the head because I'm like, CVE, PVE, what about just starting by giving education to these people? Some of them have been in camps for two years. So they didn't have education under ISIS for three years, and now it's been under your custody for two years, and you have not come up with a plan to say, gee, it's very difficult to bring in education for, for you know, a few thousand kids. Uh, you know, we have to stop kidding ourselves. The solutions is there, the solutions are there, what's really missing is the uh, political uh, will. <coughs> then I would say there are sort of added, added complexities but that, can be, that can be overcome. Uh, I think you, I'll go back to your question, sorry. I got, but I think it's, it's very important to, 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 to really highlight this and the responsibility. Countries have not had uh, a common approach. So even two years ago, uh, the, when the first families were in Ain Isa camp, before sort of Roj became the biggest camp and then Al-Hul became the biggest camp, Indonesia took back some of its nationals. Russia took back some of its nationals. Um, and there were a few handful of countries at the time. Lately, uh, one of the most interesting examples has actually been Kazakhstan. Okay, so Kazakhstan uh, took in January uh, 43 Kazakhs, men, women, and children. And just in May, they took 231. Now, when, the, uh, when people, uh, and you hear that all the time, by the way, huh, in, in most way, say, we cannot take them back. We don't know how to take them back. So does anyone know how did Kazakhstan take them back? Brownie points. Okay. Very easy. You know, the US acted as transporter. The US has military planes flying in and out of northeast Syria every day. They flew them to US base in Kuwait. Kazakhstan sent its own planes to the US base in Kuwait. They exchanged them. They flew them back. Okay. The UN Special Rapporteur uh, on Counterterrorism and Human Rights visited now these children uh, and these women and men in Kazakhstan. And they're actually doing quite well. Okay. Uh, countries that have relationships like uh, Russia, it's very easy. They just drove them to their base in Syria and they flew them from their base. Um, but the US has offered to all countries to basically act as a courier. Okay. So the... the uh, you know, there's like, well, can the U.S. do that or cannot do that? Well, it's already doing it. You know, I mean, they're flying. I mean, they're flying weapons in. The U.S. and the U.K. just agreed to increase their troops in. So, if they have a way to send troops in, they must have a way to get kids back, right? Particularly that they have actually. I mean, I've, I've seen the list that was leaked that the French have everyone, including babies that were born a few months ago. Huh? The uh, so I think this is this is one. Uh, it, there, there are possible and easy ways to get these people out. There was actually another example, because one of the most intriguing countries that I bumped into, and I never actually thought this would happen, I bumped into kids from Trinidad and Tobago, okay, who were isolated. Uh, you know who actually got them out? It was you know, this private initiative on a plane that was paid for by a Pink Floyd singer. Okay? This is who is setting policy today on one of the biggest issues that people have been talking about for the last three years. You know, countries can't figure it out. But somehow a Pink Floyd lawyer, a Pink Floyd uh, uh, you know, uh, singer can charter a pri private plane, fly it to northern Iraq. They can send a lawyer. The Kurds have no problem. They want to empty these uh, camps. They gave the children to the lawyer and the mother. They drove across, and they flew out on their private jet. Um, so you know, if there's a will, there's a possibility and practical. And eventually, France and Sweden uh, have taken some, uh, they call them the orphan kids, but they're not actually all orphans. They're unaccompanied kids. So either the mother has died or the father is in prison. The father might be alive. But basically, these are children that are being cared for by other women in the camps. And often not even being registered under the, the real name. I mean, there was a, in Fratri, there were three brothers uh, of the same uh, French mother and, and German father. The French mother died. The German father is in detention in northeast Syria. The three kids were being cared for uh, by three different women in the same camp. Okay. Uh, France eventually took them uh, back. You know why? Because actually two of the kids were in very bad shape, and a number of us told them, if these children die, it's your responsibility, because you know, we saw them, these are their photos, they're in this camp, if you don't take them out, they will die. Okay? Because one of them actually had, had been uh, injured very severely. They didn't want that on their conscience. But how do they decide, okay, these kids are okay, but the other kids, it's not okay. Uh, or, you know, it's complicated. Well, I don't think it's that complicated. 
But I also want to talk about um, something else, and it's really accountability. This is not just about the rights of uh, these ISIS suspects. I actually don't have much sympathy for, for <coughs> ISIS suspects. I think they should be tried. I have a lot more sympathy for victims of ISIS. Um, but today, victims are not getting justice. There is a victims, uh, victims, for instance, of people who disappear at the hands of ISIS, who have loved ones who disappear at the hands of ISIS. This is what happened to their loved ones. Those who were beheaded by ISIS, their families, they're not having their day in court to confront these actors. So when uh, it, it just, it, the current situation is the worst of all worlds. And the problem is with each day that passes without a solution, the problem is getting worse. Because these kids today, eventually, they will actually become dangerous. It becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. If you've been left in the, I mean, uh, you know, actually the favorite game of the kids is throwing stones at each other because there's nothing in the camp. So they, they just run around. I don't know if, you, if, you, if you'd agree with me. You know, I mean, I had two stones fly. I mean, this is the most dangerous part of the mission. That's what they do for, for games. The other biggest danger is they're living in tents. They have these uh, gas heaters. Uh, and every other day in the winter, some tents uh, get some fire. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's a really, it's a, there are a lot of legal issues that we can discuss. And then I, oh, when people start telling me about legal issues, and I say Kazakhstan. Indonesia, Russia, you know, it's not that complicated. They did it, you know. Uh, so um, I, I would, I would just, I would, I would, I would stop there. Uh. I think it's a, it's a welcome and necessary reality check uh, as to what is feasible and what is not. And sometimes, you know, the law provides a necessary framework for discussion, and sometimes it has, you know, we have to balance between the law. And the reality, and you know, the policy benefits are not doing anything um, and hiding behind legal frameworks. Before opening the floor to questions, if it's okay, I'd like to ask one of you to maybe try and draw the beginning of a recommendation for a way forward or things to keep in mind um, on those topics. And um, whoever likes to can start. Maybe somehow. I think, you know, all the recommendations have actually already been made, and mm -hmm. I agree with Nadim. I actually also I don't think the legal framework is an obstacle. I think the obstacle is political will. There is nothing in the Security Council resolutions that prevents us from taking back children, or that would prevent us from addressing the humanitarian situation. There, there is not a legal obstacle. And then I think states sometimes they like to play with alleged legal difficulties like saying we don't have diplomatic representation and we don't talk to them and everybody knows that that's all what they <coughs> spend doing but I want to follow up on, on what Nadim said and I think it's um, you know the question of accountability um, and who should be accountable and for what um, and which then links to the rights of the victims and, and in that respect I think um, it's also not useful to just think about the foreign fighters and their crimes, but there needs to be, um, you know, they have been part of a broader armed conflict where one group in particular committed atrocious atrocities and a series of peoples were associated with that armed group in a variety of ways because they controlled the territory for a long time. So who are you going to be prosecuting and for what? Um, and I think that's also very much where maybe a bit out of a transitional justice perspective could be of benefit to us, specifically to foreign fighters, then I would also say, and, and you mentioned it, you know, that for some states it's very clear they all need to be prosecuted under counterterrorism legislation. Counterterrorism legislation is not the same thing as looking into war crime. Mm -hmm. I don't think we are providing justice to the victims of ISIS if we are prosecuting people for um, being a member of a terrorist group, because as part of that, we do not necessarily have to establish what they actually did. Mm -hmm. We don't have to look into enforced disappearances. We don't have to look into torture. So I think if, we are, if that's the way states are going to go, you are failing the victims again mm -hmm. a second time, because again, you will be much more focused on your own security, and that's what counterterrorism legislation is about. So, so I think maybe that's one way of starting a, a recommendation. Can I just add, I'm building on that. I think first, there's an urgency about the camps. Uh, the, the, they need, there needs to be a solution found quickly. 
what we didn't talk about, and I think you hinted at it, the, there are the easy countries, those who can go back to their countries, and then there's, but I, let's start with the easier stuff, because that, that's actually been hard enough. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about those who cannot go back to their home countries mm -hmm. uh, because of, you know, from law issues, the, the Uyghurs, you know, you're not going to send uh, uh, Uyghurs back to China. You're not going to send Egyptians back to CC's Egypt today at this stage. It's, uh, you'd be committing a grave, grave violation. I mean, there's also a big problem with the Iraqis as well, given the torture mm -hmm. when it comes to the men, the women and children, it's a bit easier. But, the, you know, I, let's, let's park this for a second. I think it would make for a very good law school exam question. But, uh, <laughs> I think you, you, you have to reduce the numbers and there has to be a lot more pressure and I'm very happy to see that the UN mechanisms, UNICEF has actually, and ICRC for a while, but you know, the UN mechanisms have started to speak up. I think it's, it's a bit late, but better late than, than, than never. I think that needs to be uh, encouraged. Uh, countries have to take responsibility. It's not Syria's problem, it's not Iraq's problem to raise Belgians, Belgian kids. They have enough of their own problems. You know, uh, talk about, you know, the Security Council is all about this collaborative effort, this is what we're all doing, and it's like, oh, no, no, take care of them now. We don't have the means to do de-radicalization because Northeast Syria has, of course, to do de-radicalization for tens of thousands. So that's one. Accountability is an essential question. As we speak today, there's a meeting in, the, in London. Uh, I think it's a bit of a hush-hush meeting. They're trying to push for more prosecutions locally. You know, I've attended some of the prosecutions because in Syria, they are in the Northeast, they are prosecuting Syrians. You can, the system needs fixing up. You could fix it up. But I think you have to think of a sort of what I would call a triage approach to accountability. You have those who are responsible for the war crimes and crimes against humanity, you know, the leaders, those who thought about the policies of the Yazidis, who, who, those who actually, you know, the masterminds, those who committed the war crimes. And those, for all the talk about how bad ISIS is, surely they deserve a proper, you know, internationally backed tribunal for that and all the other victims of war crimes and crimes against humanity for these places. That need, you know, it should not be selective justice, it should not just be ISIS, which makes it harder for politically to push it forward, but uh, that, you know, I think that'd be really important. Then you get to the smaller fish, uh, and there, this is where you have the clear contest between IHL and CT law, and it's sort of, and, and, it, and it's more raw. IHL is very clear, you know, a combatant, if he hasn't committed a war crime, a crimes against, you know, humanity at the end of the conflict, it's finished, right? I mean, okay, this is a non-international armed conflict, so it's a bit more complicated, but basically, uh, IHL does not have much to say about them. And so all the countries are saying, well, CT, CT, we're going to nail everyone for everything. Um, and I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake because you're not going to get the story about who did what, who is responsible for what crimes. Uh, but if national countries want to do it, great, but don't expect Syria to have, you know, and particularly the self-administration in Northeast Syria, of having to punish every single foreign woman who decided, you know, uh, to travel to Northeast Syria. I mean, unless they want to prosecute them for immigration crimes, uh, you know. Uh, no, but I mean, really, I mean, take, take, I mean, all the bad things that happened in Northeast Syria, is it really their priority to prosecute a French woman who spent a lot of time on Facebook trying to recruit French women in France? I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Why should it be their priority? It's not their priority. So if France wants to prosecute them, France should come and take them and prosecute them. Because these women are not a priority for international courts either. If France is worried about this woman, let, let France deal with it. It has the means. Sorry, I, I just get worked up because I, the French, because I live in France and I've had this argument with the French way too many times. Uh, so that's, I think, too, the, the judicial triage approach is essential at this point. And it's going to mean some truth about the fact that not all terrorists are equally bad. And people don't like to hear that. Okay? But we have, I mean, as lawyers, we have to remind them. Okay? And as human rights lawyers or IHL lawyers, we have to remind them that you know, there are also IHL, and, uh, you know, IHL crimes, and war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity. And this is what we as international community care about more. So if they want to care about CP, it's their prosecution. They can do it. They have the jurisdiction over their nationals. You know, let them. Uh, uh, I think let them do it. Uh, so I think basically that that would be my um, my Thanks. contribution to recommendation. Wanda? Yes. Um, in terms of recommendations, I see is a recommendation is uh, as I was mentioning before quite uh, quite clear. Again, provided that no reform is respected, we also believe that states mm -hmm. should be uh, proactive in repatriating their their citizens and then really working uh, working towards their reintegration, of course, with um, uh, detention when that is uh, required, uh, persecution when that is needed, 
but uh, we believe that this situation is uh, is not even um, if states uh, put the question of security, I, we don't think that this situation is going to lead to a safer uh, situation for the planet. So, uh, long-term solution needs to be to be found. And again, as I mentioned earlier, from a child uh, perspective, the sooner the better. It's already late. So. Um, Thank yeah. you. I mean, I like the formulation Guantanamo on the Euphrates as provo provocating as it is, but Guantanamo was really a test for values that the international community stood for after 9-11. And it shows that the longer we ignore or choose to ignore such problems, um, you know, the more entrenched it become because Guantanamo is still open and it still has detainees. So I think it's I think it's a good it's a good parallel that makes sense and this really is a test to what values do we stand for? Uh, and then on that note, I would be very open to open the floor for questions, if anybody has one. Anissa, and then uh, here first. Anissa? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, and, and, and OK. So Anissa, the woman over there. And so thank you all for this very interesting, uh, very interesting input. So I have two questions, actually. Um, have you followed the, the talk that has been taking place uh, in Sweden in, in, in June? And perhaps some of you who have followed this, because I don't know what actually happened and what was talked about uh, in this talk, um, what, if you can tell us a little bit more about this. And uh, my second question is not really a question, but rather a comment. Um, and of course, you know, like you, uh, I'm, I'm I'm very much looking forward to some accountability. But I was wondering whether in this context of Syria, the Islamic State, which is not an empty phenomenon, I mean, it's a, it's a huge, complex, societal of problems as well. And I was wondering if just concentrating on criminal accountability is the way forward. Uh, and if we should not look into other ways, you know, like we talk about transitional justice, perhaps it's not the appropriate term, but other ways of holding persons accountable to what they have done, to hold a dialogue between all the victims. And I'm not convinced at all about the victims and the perpetrator rhetoric, or rhetoric um, because there might be victims on different you know, sides, uh, including within ISIS. Um, so are there any talks at the international level that we perhaps we should not only focus on criminal accountability, which is really black and white, uh, where here we have not a black and white situation, uh, despite what we want to say, and you all said it, I mean, including uh, Professor Sassoli, that you know, we, we, we look at the bad ISIS as the, the really bad actor, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's also a gray, uh, it's also a gray actor. Uh, and we should take this into account, I think. So I was wondering if you knew about any kind of discussion at the international level uh, that also leads into this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a pragmatic question. So I was very much surprised by the example that was brought up about France taking back three children whose health condition were kind of um, precocious. Um, I was recently approached by a Syrian person in, here in Geneva whose nephew was born during the war and now he's currently in Iraq. And he has permanent health problem um, in, in the region where he's currently staying in a UNHCR camp. He cannot receive the health care he would need to survive. And this kind of health care is something that can only be provided either in European countries or in, in the US. And I was wondering, as a lawyer, what would you suggest in this kind of situation? So what could happen to the Syrian or Iraqi children who, because of the war, were born with permanent health problems? So what's the way in this case if those countries cannot provide them with the necessary health care to survive? So what are you? In your experience, if there are other cases like this one, so what can we do from here? What can you suggest to them? Maybe the last one and then yeah. answers and then it's okay. So we have this one and then we'll do a, third, a second round of three questions. My question, I think, is more for Sandra or for you, Emily, and is because um, 
Uh, Mr. Hurley made a very good case for the moral responsibility of the states of origin and the coalition over the situation in these camps, but I wonder if there is evidence to make a, a case for the legal responsibility. So what legal responsibility these states have over what's happening in North East Syria? And what would be our legal basis? If it's just a general common article one, ensure respect, or should we go more about the decisive influence test on the European Court for extraterritorial mm -hmm. uh, responsibilities, or are we speaking about control? Do we have evidence of issues of control uh, over, over the groups that are holding these people? So I would be interested in knowing which is your views uh, on this issue and whether there will be difference between the members of the coalition and other states of origin that are not members of the coalition. Um, who would like to go first? I, mean, I could talk briefly about the Swedish proposal. Uh, I don't know Sarah, if you've been following it or if you have followed it, Wanda. I mean, for the last, you know, the Swedish proposal is just the latest iteration. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the European countries are embarrassed at this point. Okay, they have a situation uh, in part because now some of the families as well of these people are starting to move and they need to figure out, okay, we don't want this Guantanamo on the Euphrates, um, so we need to find a way to prosecute them, and we don't want to bring them back home. So politically, every few weeks they come up with a new idea. Um, the latest iteration that got some, maybe tomorrow we'll hear about the British uh, proposal because they're meeting in London today. And you know, I asked a diplomat yesterday, is it the same? You know, are you guys building up on the Swedish proposal, or? Uh, and no one gives you a, a straight answer. But the, the idea is somehow a. Add some, you know, try them there, and let's see if we can do some sort of tribunal that maybe has some international elements in it. And then, but the devil is in the detail. So when you start asking, so what does it look like? Who authorizes that? You know, is it sort of a coalition of the willing? Are you going to go to the Security Council? Can you have a, you know, where are you going to host that state? Oh, it's going to be based in the region somewhere. Uh, you know, in a previous version, people were telling me there's definitely going to be a, a, a international court for ISIS in Suleimaniya, in KR gym. Like, why Suleimaniya? Why not Erbil or Duhuk? Like, how do you guys come up with this stuff? You know, and it's like someone has a conversation with someone and there's money that's going to be paid. I'm, as you can see, I'm actually very cynical about these proposals because they haven't answered three key questions. If you talk about international tribunal, how is it going to be created internationally? Okay, I mean, what law is it going to apply? Is it going to apply international law or some sort of new counterterrorism law? I mean, you have the precedent from the Special Tribunal for Lebanon where they tried to come up with a definition of terrorism to apply internationally. It's been a bad, you know, I mean, the court is going to conclude soon. Bad precedent, in my view, to sort of follow, but, you know, that issue. What procedure, on what basis? And then you go back, I think, to something uh, Professor Sodi started with. Are you going to pick and choose people based on their nationality? You know, so the Syrians and Iraqis get prosecuted locally. We don't care. But then, you know, if you're a European, you get to this, regardless of the rank. I mean, yes, you can have different courts based on the gravity of the crime. But I have never heard of a court based on your nationality. Uh, you know, so that and the Swedish proposal again to put in the context, it came in the context of they were all hoping, you know, Iraq is the answer. I mean, that's a bad idea if you ever heard one. You know, like, let's transfer them all to Iraq. We're going to give Iraq some money. Iraq is going to prosecute them all in the sort of the way they've been doing it. And, they're going to, and you know, actually they started. There was a first transfer of foreigners mm -hmm. September of last year, October. And then there was a transfer, again, the French come up. You know, I'm not picking on the French, but I have to say they've been a bit leader on this. Uh, 11 French nationals, mm -hmm. lo and behold, were transferred. I mean, talk about refoulement. I mean, post 9-11, you know, anyone, rendition. Mm -hmm. They were transferred. Who did the transfer? I spent months investigating. No one is willing to take ownership of it. The SDF says it wasn't us. We did not want to transfer them. We don't like transferring people to Iraq. Okay, so someone did it. It wasn't an act of God. Uh, <laughs> but whoever did it violated international law. So they're not coming forward with it. So the Iraqi, you know, when they realized, I think some lawyer somewhere must have sent a memo saying, we have a bit of a problem because actually these same French defendants showed up in court and said we were tortured in Iraq. And they said, okay, all these pesky lawyers are going to have a field day with us in our national courts. So Iraq was suddenly less of, a, less of an option. Um, and now they're shopping one, you know, and Sweden is just a proposal. I haven't seen anything that gives it uh, enough meat. On the question on transitional justice, in Syria, on a local level, there is 
some mechanism of transitional justice. Uh, they don't necessarily think of it as transitional justice, but for instance, they the because the the self administration in northeast Syria is prosecuting Syrians uh, who joined ISIS, um, and there uh, they are doing amnesties quite regularly as part of reconciliation with local tribes. Uh, I, you know, it hasn't been a very good experience, and I don't like to use the word transitional justice because the victims aren't necessarily present. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly, I would say, social cohesion, because particularly the Syrian Democratic Forces found themselves, again, the example of Raqqa, if you put all the young men in jail, you have a bit of a problem. Uh, so then they tried to do a bit of a triage. So again, that sort of idea of who are, you know, those who have blood on their hands, they're going to stay in jail, those who aren't. And if someone from the tribe comes and says, we commit that, you know, these men will no longer do any crime. And there's sort of social mechanisms of control. They're releasing them. Ironically, again, so it's not really transitional, but ironically, some of them are now joining the SDF forces. Mm -hmm. huh? So again, it shows for local population joining ISIS, there may have been different motivation. Mm -hmm. Some of them were driven, you know, I've been a fighter since the beginning of the Syria war. This is the new game in town. I'm joining and I'm going to get a salary. So that, that's a transitional justice in Iraq has not really taken off very, very much. Uh, there are some people writing about it, uh, but there isn't, you know, I mean, they've taken a very counter-terrorism, everyone gets prosecuted with the same norms. Internationally, I think, unfortunately, the discussion has been so dominated by this counter-terrorism framework, so dominated, you know, and, and Resolution 21, uh, 78, uh, you know, has in a way closed the door, in my view, for a real intelligent conversation on what it means. But you know, there's transitional justice there, and then there's the issue, you know, I mean, are societies ready to re have a real conversation on why did so many people from our country join uh, ISIS? Um, and interestingly, here you find, they talk about different approaches. Unlike, I mean, countries like, I, I go back to Kazakhstan, not that Kazakhstan is a human rights model, far from that, but mm -hmm. there's sort of a pragmatic approach. Even Chechnya, and God knows I'm not a fan of Kadyrov, but <laughs> they have approached the issue from a perspective, let's understand why these women and men have traveled. So they're actually, you know, we're doing a lot more, uh, you know, they're, look, they're doing a lot more outside the box thinking about de-radicalization than Western Europe, for instance, that has taken a purely uh, uh, counterterrorism, purely criminalized. I mean, even actually children, those actually there were five French children that were brought back. They come back, the first point of entry usually is, uh, you know, one of the military, either the military airport or Wasi. It's automatically le juge des enfants. So it's all very much judiciarized, even for very, very young children. That's sort of the, the, the approach. Sandra, do you want to say a few words on state responsibility? Yeah, well, first I just want to confirm what Dandim says. When, whenever, whenever I would bring up the question of transitional justice, mm -hmm. I just confirm what Dandim says, you get immediately shut down. And I think that's another part of the, like, you know, IHL is a big victim to counter-terrorism, but I think mm -hmm. transitional justice as well, because there's literally no room to even speak about amnesties. You can't have amnesties for terrorists, mm -hmm. and you can't negotiate with terrorists as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's um, just also to bounce up on, you know, conflicts are never black and white, but I would also say, you know, the same thing is true for individuals in an armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Many people can be simultaneously victims and perpetrators, and I think that's something of the challenges when we deal with armed conflicts. It would be easy if you just have the good and the bad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's all neatly separated, and it's maybe part of the tension that we can see playing out when it comes to the children. No, which some of them, but at the same time, it's not something new, no? We had it in Sierra Leone, and mm -hmm. what I also find interesting when you mentioned Guantanamo Bay, it's many of the discussions we have now in relation to children, we had them in Guantanamo Bay when they mm -hmm. brought in the Canadian teenager. Mm -hmm. So it's not new, you know? It may be a different scope and concern a different amount of children, but from a legal perspective, at least, we have already solved that in a way. Mm -hmm. um, now it just be practically more, um, Difficult. The question of um, state responsibility, I think um, 
I think in a way you gave the answer yourself. Um, I think for, for European countries, I think it is interesting to think about the approach of extraterritoriality mm -hmm. and how it can, whether you could use the decisive influence over the running of the camps to establish. And then the way Nadine described it, if I now think about the cases um, against Russia in, in Moldavia, I think you can probably have an analogy that they may have a similar influence. Um, over these camps and therefore may have some responsibility. But as you know, the European Court, um, and they're always a little bit mixed up between whether this is jurisdiction or state responsibility, but they do arrive at the conclusion, at least when it came to, to Russia in these contexts, that yes, they do have a decisive influence. And what is happening in these camps um, uh, would probably not be happening without them. From a state responsibility question, it's a bit more tricky again because of the non-state act issues. Because while we have state complicity, we do not have complicity of states with armed groups um, as, um, as like a ground of attribution. And as you know, at least if you follow the international code of justice, effective control is an extremely high threshold. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we would actually reach that threshold and the complicating factor may actually also be the um, number of states being involved mm -hmm. and how would you actually determine which is the one that if you would end up being saying the US then the US would say oh but we're the ones who are offering flights out to everybody um, so you would probably also have to think a little bit about extraterritorial effects mm -hmm. of policies which we haven't done in relation to people abroad but we have done in relation to companies who act abroad. Mm -hmm. So maybe that would be another avenue to explore uh, the responsibility of states of origins in relation to these people. Yeah. And does any of you want to address the last question with regards to, you know... Yes, uh, about, uh, about uh, children. The, 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 children. Yeah, the children and the healthcare uh, example. But uh, uh, indeed, well, already the, 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 the starting point should be that every child uh, belong of mm -hmm. citizen of a state should be uh, entitled to that kind of assistance. Already uh, picking and choosing uh, uh, children on the base though, uh, of course of their vulnerability, but like uh, putting additional criteria to already their status as a child, it is a bit of a problem. Uh, as I said before, a child is below 18 years old and the state hopefully would be able to assist all of them. Um, now, with the difference uh, between uh, uh, a local child and uh, uh, a foreign child having access to different services, um, on one side, this is what we were mentioning before, the needs are exactly the same. Possibly not all solutions can be applied to every uh, to every child, but it is definitely um, the case if all the foreigners also would be able to return to the countries, that these countries would have so many more additional resources to address their own internal problems, and uh, and that would of course uh, relieve uh, uh, the pressure on their on their citizens and on the the, the, the troubles that they they're facing. And access to healthcare is just uh, is just uh, one example. Uh, so um, making a rank of uh, children that uh, would uh, uh, have access to uh, state assistance, maybe uh, orphans, as we mentioned earlier, unaccompanied uh, or wounded. This is already um, limiting uh, children's access to their own rights mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, so this is a problem. But if I understand, so is this someone with like a particularly serious case? They don't have the treatment? I mean, for yeah. these cases, there are some NGOs. If it's like a particular kind of burn that, you know, you have to go get treated in Germany because it doesn't, they don't do that kind of operation in Iraq. I mean, Iraq, you know, there are, there are a bunch of, there are special charities and we can talk offline that you can look at them. You know, one of them is Anira that looks at, you know, for Syrian refugees. Uh, but really, it's, it has to be particularly, you know, case that doesn't fit within the services available in countries like Iraq and, and, and Syria. And just very, very quickly, I think on, on something that Sandra said, and, and the test of uh, the question of responsibility uh, is actually a fascinating question because this is the way wars today and the future are being waged. I mean, if you think about 
the wars and such. this is not just some exotic thing that's happening in northeast Syria. Mm -hmm. Take take what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa today. Okay, you've got you know the fancy ones with the money in the air, very light footprint on the ground because we don't want Western soldiers dying. You know they're contracting all sorts of you know it could be state actors, it could be non-state actors, it could be mercenaries. You know you could have Blackwater in there as well. You know it doesn't matter. Depends who's paying. The UAE pays Blackwater, no problem. Other countries don't like to pay Blackwater. And, and then when it comes to accountability, everyone raises, you know, lifts their hands like, we're not responsible. You know? And you end up with the uh, small one. And that has actually been an issue. And what Sandra was saying as well about a coalition, we've seen that when it comes to responsibility for particular coalition strikes. No one would take, you know, everyone says, well, we can't tell you who was responsible for the strike that killed the civilians. You know, and it's the dilution of responsibility. And uh, I think uh, those of you who are, you know, doing food, you know, the, the non-state actor in some remote corner of the world that uh, is, is, in my view, not the one, to, you know, they're, they're not the ones that are setting up the real policy here. Thanks. I think we had three questions already. There was one on the back, one here, and one here. Um, thanks a lot, Dr. for, for, for the enlightening information. Um, I think the panel today, in particular you, Nadine, have you've really debunked very well the various excuses um, given by some governments in terms of the, their quote-unquote inability to go with their citizens on the camps. Is there um, a concerted effort by civil society, INGOs, to generate some awareness among the populations in these countries of origin? Or the absence of some of these um, hurdles to getting their citizens. Because if I look at the debate in my country of origin, which is Finland, that sort of that sort of knowledge is, is largely absent. There are there are statements by the ICRC, there are statements by law professors and so forth as to the legal framework, but as to the actual ability to go get one's citizens. That, that side of the story is not coming through, which is why, given that there's little political wealth, the government's going to be connected to that, that, that spiel. So, so just, the, just the question of whether there's sort of a, a coordinated effort to, to do some awareness raising. Thank you. I have two questions for Anda. Um, first question, uh, you mentioned Al uh, I seriously work in Al Hall, uh, but Al Hall is mostly, mostly women and children. What about the, the work I seriously does with the male detainees? Uh, my question would be, do you have um, access issues to detention facilities in northeastern Syria, specific facilities or specific high-value detainees? Are they interested in access? And uh, my second question is, you mentioned the track and trace forms that ICRC uses for foreign fighters and defenders for correspondents. I've seen a bunch of these forms, and some of these form, forms come from detainees in Syria, and some of these forms come from detainees who are in Syria, but where they can transfer to Iraq. Uh, there's one fundamental difference between the two forms. The Syrian forms get redactions from the locations. Who makes the decision? So, so the track and trace form indicates where the person is detained, right? For Iraqi forms, there's a specific facility, let's say, part of the terrorism center in Baghdad, and so on. On the Syrian forms, these locations are redacted. So, so originally, the team would write something, and you see that they have been blacked out. So what's the policy of ICC on applying protections to the track and trace forms, as, especially when it comes to locations of the detainees? Okay, um, just the last yeah. question. Yes, uh, mine, I, I'm not sure if it, thank you very much. I'm not sure if it's a question, a concern, like a, just a, comment. a comment. I mean, I would like to focus on what you mentioned, like as this legal crisis side of the of the topic that has us together today in relation to state re responsibility, jurisdiction. I also agree that we don't know which is going to be the result, but there is some movement within like UN, some regional tribunals, there are cases before the European Court saying that there is an <coughs> obligation to repatriate the same has reached the Committee on the Rights of the Child against your favorite country, France. Then. And here is the question. I mean, how can we start talking about this obligation to repatriate? Because actually, when one that you were speaking, you were referring to the attitudes of the states, the different attitudes of these countries. And then the, 
the war responsibility was not really there. And it was like, okay, if you read Le Monde, they would say, France just repatriated uh, five kids, and the approach is case by case. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is like, is this, no, it's not a question, it's an expression, but basically it's like, you have to be a lucky kid, or you have to have you sending this picture of someone like close to be like uh, lacking all your body parts or like about to die. And my question there is like, how do we lawyers play a bit more with the law, leaving aside this effective control threshold mm -hmm. or like the impact, the extraterritorial impact of your policies there, mm -hmm. leaving aside is France as you were saying, more like on another kind of discussion has which kind of effect or control of if there are diplomat representatives, they are there or not. How do we get that away and saying France, Sweden, Belgium, they have an obligation, mm -hmm. but not for what is happening there that is horrendous, but for keeping them there. Mm -hmm. And so I work... On, OECHR with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this convention could start be using in a different way. I mean, there's an obligation when you have grandparents in France saying you have an obligation to repatriate, you have this obligation to just like unaccompanied children, just like take all necessary measures to bring them with family. So, in the case of an accompanied child there. So I don't know. I, I want to know your opinion on talking about the of international legal obligation to repatriate yeah. of states. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Not about this. But, <laughs> um, one, I think, interesting discussion or possible avenue is actually common article one, I think, for respect and mutual respect, because keeping those people there, you know, being injured, as Madeline said very rightfully, if you're under three years old or under six years old, and even if you're 12, you know, you might not be a security threat. So you could try to start thinking about an argument that, you know, states of origin have a responsibility to ensure respect for IHN by the SDF and not keep those people, you know, but you have to stretch it out because it's an obligation with a very low threshold. But then the high threshold depends on the political will. So I my humble opinion is that something that you could articulate based on common but in case Can I add just something on the obligation? Have you, are you familiar with the Belgian case? Uh, in the we, domestic court? In the domestic court, mm -hmm. the appeal, and yes. they lost the, the second, but the, there was an appeal that was issued around Christmas yeah. of last year. For me, it's the most interesting example. So this was a case brought uh, in Belgium by the lawyers of two Belgian women and their children uh, to sort of say you have to repatriate. And it's very interesting because the court really struggled and eventually the court found that yes, so they could not say that Belgium has an obligation to repatriate, but Belgium has an obligation to do what it can and to show the court that it did what it can to uh, provide consular assistance and to try to bring that back. You have to look at the formulation because that's interesting. Uh, the state argued, look, we don't have consular representation in Syria. But what was interesting, you know, the court said yes, but Maybe you could do other things. For instance, uh, usually a country, if they don't have consular representation in the country, uh, they have a third country representing their interests. So did you ask for a third country to represent your interests? What they didn't do at the time, because at the time, the Kazakhstan precedent had not been set yet. Uh, you know, they did not consider, well, what if a third country is willing to bring them out? So then you don't actually have to go there. You know, is this something that you would consider? Unfortunately, the state appealed that decision yeah. and the state won eventually. Uh, but the, if you look at that uh, precedent, for me, it's the most advanced at this point articulation because you can see the court trying to look at, uh, it's mostly under human rights issues, they don't think of not necessarily under IHL, yeah. uh, the CRC uh, logic. And I, and I thought there was actually something there. And now you have a bunch of lawyers in Europe who are trying these, uh, 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 these cases. So that could be, you know, at least that's the case I'm familiar with, that the court went as far, and I thought the way they phrased it was actually quite a smart way to, to move it forward. I would really say, I sometimes I don't find it a very useful discussion to say, because when, when you ask, is there a legal obligation, and the answer will be no, or then there will be a discussion about whether there's a legal obligation or not. But I think it's much more interesting the way the Belgian court did is to say, 
okay, you know, the legal obligation is actually that you do have to take all measures that are feasible in order to alleviate the situation. And that I think you can find in human rights laws under the doctrine of positive obligations, which are somehow a different kind of jurisdiction on which, um, and particularly when it comes from children. What I also find interesting, I mean, in relation to the question whether there's a concerted effort um, to raise awareness, I mean, at least in Switzerland, I don't think so. But what I think was also interesting in Belgium, and, and I mean, you may not be agents in this way involved, but I think in the context of that case, you had one of the Belgian child protection mm, agencies. The person. Yes, who became involved. Um, because you know, otherwise it's easily dismissed as it's the humanitarians, the human rights people, and they're all like, they see the world as rainbows and unicorns. But to have the child protection agency involved, I think that really had an impact on people. To actually say this is also a child protection issue that our own agencies recognize as such. So it's not the usual suspects. Um, and I think that's an interesting avenue to explore as well. You know, how would you actually, the people who are also very much familiar with the best interests of the child's decisions, you know, that's what they do on a daily basis. How can you bring them into that? Um, and use their leverage, but also their expertise when it comes to these kind of issues. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to comment, of course I will answer uh, to your question as well, but I also wanted to comment on the um, involvement of the civil society. And I think that somehow we, uh, we have uh, we underlooking a bit the role of family associations, there are family associations that are active in very many countries. However, uh, the feeling that I, that I got exploring it a bit is that the stigmatization, the fear for stigmatization is also very heavy in them. And so it's, uh, it's, um, it's very difficult for them to, to be very vocal because uh, there are people that are actually uh, scared of possibly losing their jobs and losing their um, uh, acceptance in, in their own community. And interestingly, somebody made uh, once a comment to me that the families that are the most vocal are the families of the converted people that have joined because that stigma is less attached to them as it is to the, their children that have left. Whereas uh, uh, families that are not converted really have a hard time uh, coming forward and uh, and uh, being vocal about uh, their rights. So this is why so many cases are interesting where the families, they, um, they, they bring their cases to the state for having their, their rights uh, uh, fulfilled because uh, it's not so usual that families have that kind of, uh, of um, uh, strength. Um, now, on uh, your questions, it was not uh, by chance that these other aspects of our activities uh, uh, were mentioned in my, in my um, presentation because you seem to be very familiar with the ICRC work. Uh, so I'm sure you, you can understand how these are topics that are usually um, part of a bilateral dialogue that we have with the different uh, actors that are in the field and uh, are not necessarily uh, for a wider uh, discussion um, at the risk of putting uh, the action in the field at, uh, at uh, risk. So this is why I haven't commented on this. I uh, understand there are different forms and views in different countries uh, in different ways depending on what uh, the activities demand uh, to reach our objectives. So I'm sorry I cannot comment further. So there's no public policy in redactions, let's say, of, on the redactions of, of messages? Uh, I, I don't know in particular, I don't, you seem to have seen many more messages that I have seen personally, because they don't come through Geneva. Um, the messages uh, are open, and uh, and this is a general policy of ICC, so I'm not talking about uh, uh, Syria or Iraq necessarily. Uh, whenever a message is collected in a place of detention, by definition, it has to be censored by the authority, okay. who only uh, uh, 
uh, allow family messages. This is a uh, family message to, to go out. This is uh, a protection for us, for our work, and it's a protection uh, also for the detainee. We also do a first screening of the messages before providing it to the, to the authority so that we make sure that inadvertently any uh, political message or message of any other sort is included in our Red Cross messages. Because the goal of the Red Cross message is family news, is family contact, and we're very careful in making sure that this instrument is not turned around by the system for other purposes. So yes, the detaining authorities in general have the right to censor the messages if they believe that uh, the content is not in line with the actual um, objective of the message. So I don't know specifically the, the sentence okay. that uh, that you were uh, you were mentioning, but uh, it is a possibility. One thing I mean, just that they have allowed some visits from women to their husbands at the daily prison, for instance. If you live in Roshka, not from my home, but Roshka, there have been some allowing. Uh, Something. So it's also ad hoc, it depends on the facility and how far the transport is. Yeah. Um, we would have time for one last question. Other way. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, we've spoken a lot here about building political will and how that will be the most important moving forward. But of course, after the initial um, policy action, whether that is bringing people back to their countries of origin or um, implementing more humanitarian aid in these camp settings, there will be follow-on policy decisions, right? So let's say that people were brought back to their countries of origin and perhaps the parent prosecuted that the child was not. Then you have a situation where children are separated from their parents and in, in need of some sort of guardianship. So, I guess my, my broad question is how, how as a community should we consider the question of building political will? What are some strategies that you've seen work and not work? And what messages would you send to countries um, that are, are not currently putting their people back um, in terms of you know, additional follow-on policy support for these challenges that might emerge down the line? I can just quickly talk about our experience lobbying. Uh, I mean, it's been a very lonely field for a long time. I mean, you don't get popular when you go on radio and TV. You tell people you have to bring those back. Uh, I mean, uh, you get insulted. Uh, I have an Arabic name. I'm a terrorist lover. I'm an extremist. You know, you get you get a lot of uh, lovely uh, messages afterwards. The the problem is the you know in Germany and in France you had state prosecutor talk about children by describing them as time bombs. Mm -hmm. okay. When you have someone in that position of authority saying that, <coughs> good luck. You know, uh, they're like, we're going to trust them as opposed to, you know, you pee, you know, you unicorn loving. Actually, my daughter would be very happy to know unicorn loving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you unicorn loving uh, human rights type. So it's been challenging. I mean, the families have done very courageous work uh, lately. They've kind of been going up in crescendo. Uh, it's been hard, they've also failed a bend because back in 2014-2015, families were perceived as allies of the state. Mm -hmm. If you go back, most of them were the ones who reported their children to the state. They were seen as the key allies. I mean, again, go back to the CVE, PVE, all that bullshit, sorry. Uh, it's all about assisting the families, working with the families. And then something changed, and now, after 2015-16, these families are seen as somehow, they're being pointed at finger, they're having, you know, uh, They've, some of them have sent money to their loved ones in the camps, and it's actually in, uh, some of them have been investigating for financing terrorism, for sending money so that, because in the camps you actually have a market. Uh, they're, they're, there's a hierarchy, particularly in Roj, and that hasn't been created in Roj, there's a market, and women with money actually can have a TV and they can hire other women to do the cleaning and taking care of the kids. It's actually quite impressive. Uh, uh, so I think you need, you need more voices, uh, not just the human rights movement, you know, the sort of Child protection, you know, UNICEF, it was great that UNICEF about a couple of months came up with a statement. Now you have more and more the UN uh, uh, speaking out. These sort of ombuds people that take care of these issues. I think it was in the Netherlands, I'm not sure it was Netherlands or Belgium. One of them, anyways, spoke up very forcefully about it. 
you need a few courageous parliamentarians uh, to speak out. But you know, in France, we got very, very close. France was ready to repatriate everyone. Mm -hmm. And a few days before, and we don't know if this changed, you know, a, a magazine that's close to the far right, or to the right, I should say, did a uh, survey that showed, I think, uh, an insanely high proportion of the French population was against the repatriation of the children. I don't know how the question was asked. I was shocked by the numbers. You know, politicians today, they, they rule by uh, uh, polls. So they're like, ah, you know, on the balance, let's, let's uh, do that. Interestingly, you know, talk about Shamima, you know, the, the UK. Her, the baby died. No one was moved in the UK. You know, there was no sort of feeling of, oh shit, this is a little British kid who died. Uh, you, you know, this is a baby. They're not responsible for anything. It was like, good for her. She deserved it. Um, so it's, it's been, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm, I, it, it's been hard, even within the human rights movement, outside uh, the groups that tend to work a lot on, on children's rights issues have actually been reluctant to take so far, a very uh, outspoken uh, position. I think it's about to change because I think the situation is getting so bad. I think I'll all show it as a humanitarian disaster. Uh, but you know, I've heard people saying we worry that if donors know that we're working in these camps, that somehow it will affect us. There are issues as well with some of the counterterrorism laws these days about whether you're financing terrorism if you're doing assistance work with some of these women. You know, are you doing material support? It's a, uh, you know, the CT framework is a, is a bit of a uh, disaster, right? Also, I wanted to mention one thing um, that uh, we, it, it's hardly ever mentioned, but uh, we're talking about repatriations, but over the years, there have been also several spontaneous returns mm -hmm. to the countries. And so, and of course, these people are known to the states. So, uh, also this, uh, um, a blockage in being proactive as often justified by the fact that they, they don't know how to handle with this case, but actually there, there have been practices <coughs> that have been uh, going on, maybe more silently, uh, because not ending up on, on newspapers. But uh, there are experiences of people that have been back for longer periods from which uh, knowledge and uh, uh, a longer term perspective can be uh, drawn. Yeah, that's true. And, and there are two cases of one in the Netherlands and one in Germany where people have been back, one in women and men, and who are actually currently being put on trial for both for crimes and I mean, all countries have had returnees, yeah. right? Well, when the third border with Turkey was open, mm -hmm. they come back, and now they have, to, you know, with some of these yeah. children, they've followed them now for two years. And they're assessing, and there was actually a recent article saying it's actually been a success story. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I don't know if they're all success stories. I mean, these children have been through horrible trauma. But and again, the, I mean, there's a lot of experience. Maybe they don't have experience. There's all the experience of people who worked on demobilization of child soldiers. There are all the people who do, uh, you know, uh, works. I mean, it's not true that Western countries don't know how to do. In a way, it's actually giving ISIS too much power. It's actually presenting ISIS as like they've got supernatural powers, and once they convince you. You can't be de-radicalized. That's how powerful it is. Countries have been dealing with children who've been brought into by their parents to sex for years, right? I mean, uh, sex exists, and ISIS is a form of sex, and the parents who took their kids are like sect followers who follow the guru. Uh, the states have all, often taken the, the, the kids. So I, if there's a will, I, the capacity is there, the, the, the money is there. You know, it's, of course, it's got to cost some money, but everything costs some money. The drones cost money. Just on the question of internees, I, and I think I'm just thinking of something that the weight of internees is much lower than states anticipate. Not good states are somehow thrilled about that. But I think the question of internees also shows um, because of the ones who come back, the ones who are known, there is pretty service laws that they will always worry about the ones who don't know. I'm not sure to what extent this is a problem, but I think it also shows part of the because of course if you come back in a non-controlled way, all by yourself. I think I would be more worried about not them being involved in acts of terrorism, but about their um, sort of psychosocial well-being. Mm -hmm. That they may already be a danger to themselves, or maybe they need family members. And I think by having an overly broad criminalization, you actually play into that. Um, and then if history teaches us anything, because we had like one of the first major foreign fighter hotspots, was mm -hmm. of course post-Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. 
many of the front, the Saudi front fighters, they couldn't go back. And what did they do? They went all over the world and set up new groups. If now you think about that we have a much larger concentration of foreign fighters than a much broader geographic scope, you may probably also from a security perspective, it's better to have a controlled approach to how we're going to deal with them in a long-term perspective, mm -hmm. rather than just leave them in a camp in Syria and hope for the best. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the security officials in Western countries want them to be returned, ironically. They're not the ones blocking, as far as what I've been told, uh, because they want to debrief them. They think they're essential for some of their own domestic investigations. Some of the magistrates and the judges want them here because they can fill the important pieces. And because of what you said, they'd rather have them close at hand. Yes, it would be a bit of a pain to have them all in prison, all these men, and, and deal, but at least they know where they are. They can, you know, they can have a better handle. It's really been the politicians, and when you ask them, they basically say it would only take one person who returns, who commits uh, an attack, and politically the opposition will, will just use it. And, and, and it's because of that fear that maybe one that commits one attack, and that it will cost them politically, they're like, you know, we just don't want to take the risk. You know, it's risk averse. Uh, you know, you can maybe understand from a political perspective, but it's like, okay, this is leadership by the polls. You know, it's not taking.